Welcome to In China with Michelle Zhou. Manufacturers have long known China to be a leader in their industry, but now the world is recognizing China as a business center for companies, market traders, education, and artists. It's no wonder that the economy has grown to be the world's second largest. In our program, you'll learn from the thought leaders and professionals who have lived in both the U.S. and China and continue to do business there. Now. Here is your host, Michelle Zhou. Welcome to In China with Michelle Zhou. I'm your host, Michelle. I'm the founder and the CEO of Pacific Technologies Consulting Group. We help American and Chinese organizations learn from each other, bridge their needs, and grow their businesses internationally. You can contact me at our company website, ptcgconsulting.com. And I always welcome you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Today, I invited Mr. Steve Drake to the show. He's a longtime public relations veteran and have helped launch the famous American brands to China back in the 1990s. Brands you all know, such as Walmart and Budweiser. We would like to talk about effective communications, the key to brand reputation. And success in China. Welcome to the show, Steve. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It's a, it's a delight to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. Yes, Steve, you have such an exciting career in PR and communications. I would love to get a lot of stories from you today and help our audience learn from you. So, let's start with your introduction. Could、sure. you please first introduce yourself to our audience, and especially your connection with China? Okay, I'd be be happy to do that. Well, again, my name is Steve Drake, as you just heard Michelle say that, and I am、uh, now living in Maryland, and I actually grew up in Maryland,、uh, the the other Washington.、Uh, Michelle is in is in Seattle, Washington. I'm just outside Washington D.C. and、um, I actually went to、uh, college locally at the University of Maryland, where I、uh, studied public relations in the early 1980s, and、uh, started working in the field. I guess in the in the mid mid 1980s,、uh, mostly with、uh, you know small and then、uh, subsequently a large public relations firm called、uh, Fleischman Hillard. I joined. The Washington D.C. office of Fleischman Hillard in 1988. I know that I'm dating myself.、Uh, Probably makes me an, an old, old China hand, I guess you'd say. But、uh, started there again in the late '80s, and found myself、uh, a couple years later being asked to manage a China-related project. This was again、uh, probably late 1990, early 1991, just a couple of years after the June 4, you know,、uh, Tiananmen、uh, incident in China. Oh yeah, and, that incident uh, uh, was 1989. 89, right. So this was probably about a year after that or so, and I was asked to manage a project for the China National Tourism Administration of China.、Uh, they wanted to come over、uh, to the United States and, if you will, repair relations and, in fact, frankly, build relations with、um, tourism-related companies and organizations here in the United States. I won't go into all the gory details, but we—I managed a、um, about a five-city tour for officials from the CNTA, the China National Tourism Administration, and some of the large state-run、uh, Chinese tourist companies in the、uh, throughout the United States. What that made me, I guess,、uh, within Fleischman Hillard, the PR firm, was kind of our resident China expert. Now, mind you, I had not had any background in in China or Chinese. But、um, because of that,、uh, because of that that project, when a couple of our clients and, and Michelle, you just noted them,、uh, two of them in particular, Walmart and Anheuser Busch, the, the maker of、uh, Budweiser beer, now it's uh, 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 AB InBev, is the name of the company. Now they were sort of pushing our chairman of, of the public relations firm to really open up in China. Both of those both of those large companies really wanted to introduce themselves and their brands. Into China, and again, this is in the early 1990s. So、um, I was,、uh, I guess, I always say I was in the right place at the right time, right time, or the wrong place at the wrong time. But I was asked if I would be interested in leading our、uh, entry into China as a company. 
And so in 1991, I found myself on a plane uh, going to China for the first time in my lifetime anyway. And over the next couple of years, built a relationship with the organization that would become Fleischmann Hillard's partner, a joint venture partner in, uh, in Beijing, where I uh, opened our first office in Beijing in 1994, the early to mid part of 1994, and a couple years later, opened the second office in Shanghai. And so altogether, I was in China, lived and worked in China for about five years during that period. And uh, that's where I really, I guess, got to know, obviously, China and helped help build the brands that I think we're going to talk about here today. And since then, since returning to the United States in the late 1990s, I've, uh, because of that experience, I've really intentionally tried to keep my hand in China-related work, uh, business, and issues. And so uh, that's really kind of, uh, kind of my background, Michelle, in terms of uh, not only my, my public, re- how I sort of got into public relations, but specifically how I got to do the focus of China. Mm. So you witnessed the rapid growth in China, because China opened the door in the early 80s, or more accurately, the late 70s, but the economy started to grow in the 80s. And then the U.S.-China relationship start to warm. So um, I'm curious about what was your first impression when you went to China and what's the impression now from your eyes? Sure. Well, I mean, my, my first impression was um, it, it was an interesting time in China. Again, this was the you know, 1994. And my impression then, and it still is, uh, was one of optimism. I had never, I had never witnessed or been to a place where um, there was so much sort of just what I call raw optimism on the part of everyone I met, whether it was you know someone in the street, the street cleaner, um, you know the the girl behind the counter in in one of the hotels that I was checking into, uh, or certainly our joint venture partner and uh, the employees, and there was this sense that um, things were really moving. You know, the government, uh, the government was actively trying to build the economy. Uh, and, um, and of course, that was reflected in the tremendous growth, physical growth. And it was reflected, frankly, in people like me and, and everyone else. Everyone was being, you know, Americans by the droves were being sent to China to introduce brands, to open operations. And so it was, uh, it was quite an exciting time. Um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of physical growth during that period. And of course, I've, I've had the opportunity to go back many times since returning to the United States in, in the late 1990s. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm stunned and my, my mouth is open, my jaw is on the floor every time I go to see the changes and how, um, how sophisticated China's become. Again, not just in terms of the buildings going up and the roads being built, but the, um, the average people who have, uh, have really taken advantage of that optimism and of the opportunities that that they've taken for themselves and that have been provided by the, the government both and uh, have really uh, improved their their lifestyles their outlooks etc so i'm a china i'm a china supporter and admirer that's not to say that i don't have my criticisms of china having been there and having you know been sort of involved in it for a long time but but on balance um i've been nothing but impressed and again i just go back to the word optimism michelle Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, Chinese, let's talk about people, right? Uh, when we had a chance to open the door and uh, learn from each other and get exposed to the Western culture, um, more advanced management, and many other things, because I grew up in China. So we changed a lot, uh, particularly on my side. Uh, I was working for HP from mm-hmm. 1994 to 98 then from 98 i came to the us mm-hmm. so i found myself really impacted by the company culture from like hp mm-hmm. i compared myself you know the same person i was in my 20s i could just compare myself the motivation the way mm-hmm. how i work the the uh, spirit right <laughs> the energy it's different that really inspired me right once i uh, worked in the company for a while in the american company one of the greatest company at that time and mm-hmm. i learned a lot of those uh, uh, system and the, the philosophy and i decided i want to come to the u.s to learn 
through MBA program to learn this uh, modern management style the philosophy. And then I wanted to bring it back to help Chinese companies become right. better. So that was uh, it, the kind of mentality people have, right? people like me have. Oh, we want to learn these new things. We want to absorb things. And then we combine what we know, and then we make it better. <laughs> Well, and, and it's interesting that you, your experience is sort of parallel in a way to, to that of a, a, a number of my Chinese staff. You said you worked for HP from 94 to 98. That's when I was there opening and building these offices. And one of the things that I, I guess I've achieved and of which I'm most proud is that those probably 20, 20 to 25 Chinese staff that I had over that four-year period some of them have had paths that are very similar to yours, Michelle. They, they've chosen to come here to the United States, continue their education. Some of them have stayed in China, but I will tell you, all of them have succeeded just as you clearly have and uh, have, um, again, taken, the, taken those, those opportunities that they had early and uh, taken advantage of it, not only for themselves, but for their families. And I think they've made... Um, the companies, uh, the organizations they're now working for, and they're doing many different things that much better. So, uh, so yeah, you're you're a living, breathing uh, version of what I'm talking about, I guess. Uh, you know, and uh, and again, doesn't doesn't mean that everyone has taken that path back here to the United, you know, here to the United States and back, but but all of them have uh, have have succeeded very very well. And I'd like to think I had at least a little something to do with that. Although I, you know, I also know that um, that that intelligence and ambition is was inherent and obviously it was in you and it was in in the staff i the chinese staff i had so i guess i was perhaps a like a coach i i i, mm -hmm. I saw the raw talent i gave them some opportunity on you know, maybe refined it a little bit and then i frankly just kind of got out of their way and and boy now they they all have uh, have done so so very well so Mm -hmm. So is the company you worked for still having those offices in China and is it still doing pretty they, well? They, they, they do. In fact, they have um, uh, several more offices. I know in addition to Beijing, Shanghai, I think uh, Guangzhou, they may have a, a, uh, an operation in southwest China, Chengdu, mm. um, maybe even the northeast China, uh, Jilin province, I believe. But um, so, you know, the company has done very, very well. And it, in fact, it's probably one of the, the high growth regions for Fleischmann Hiller um, as well. Of course, now, unlike when I was there, my, my main competition when I was there in the mid 90s were other other American branded public relations firms, frankly, some of whom had been there for 10 years. A couple of my competitors actually were there really early in the mid 80s. So but now. Um, my, my former company that I was with, Fleischmann Hillard, and all those other American companies not only are continue to grow and compete with each other, but now some of those people that I just mentioned, some of those staff from, from the, uh, the PR, the American PR firms have gone out and started their own. Mm. So there's many you know, Chinese locally owned um, and very substantial and very, very good marketing and public relations and communications firms. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. You help the people grow. <laughs> Well, they help. They help me grow too, and we can we can get into that more later. But uh, I I was a better person for having uh, learned from them as individuals, and frankly, from learned from China as well. So mm -hmm. it truly was the four most rewarding professionally, my the four most rewarding years of of my of my career. I have to say. So, well, let's dive into it a little bit more. Um, I'd love to hear some stories about the introduction of American or other foreign brands to China uh, and what you've learned from that. Can sure. you share with us a, a couple of stories of the things you have done? Well, I mean, uh, since you mentioned them in your introduction, I guess, you know, two of, of my biggest clients in, in China, in, in fact, again, as, we, as I just mentioned, really kind of responsible for me being over there at the time and opening the office uh, were um, Anheuser-Busch and uh, Walmart. Both of these companies uh, uh, were and, and still are to a degree, and Anheuser-Busch equals Budweiser beer. They are iconic, you know, American brands. Mm -hmm. And remember, they were coming from, from a, a market where they were both, uh, in fact, you know, Anheuser-Busch called Budweiser the king of beers. I was going to say both Anheuser-Busch and Walmart were sort of kings 
certainly in the U.S. market. So imagine, imagine both of them, frankly, coming to China in the, in the early to mid, the mid-1990s, being the kings here in the United States, expecting that, you know, they're going to they're gonna quickly become kings in China. And they were, they were humbled, you know, both, both brands. So I think Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch may have had like a 50% market share here in the United States at the time, in the, in the early to mid-90s. In, in China, even after they introduced Budweiser, um, and I don't know what it is now, but they were a fraction of 1% market share. They were one of just all sorts of, of, of brands over there. And likewise, Walmart uh, over here uh, in the United States had dealt for years and years with going into a small town and raising the ire of, you know, mom, we call mom and pop shops, uh, small retail uh, because of their size and the fact that they could price things lower than, than just about anyone else. And they, you know, in many ways, they drove some of those small retailers out of business. Inter- interestingly enough, Michelle, they dealt with some of those same issues in China. Mm-hmm. Yes, there were mom and pop stores that in, in some of the markets where they wanted to open up. And I can talk in a second about their first super center was in Shenzhen, just across the border from, from Hong Kong. But as well, the state-owned retail operations and stores in China were concerned because they knew of, of, of Walmart's reputation. So when we talk about you know, introducing two brands into China, one of the first things that I think, I'd like to think we helped them, both, both of these brands do, was, was to do so humbly, meaning you know, just because you kind of own the market here in the United States doesn't mean that you should come in and act like you know you're all elbows and knees, and you own the market in in, in China. The arrogance, right? <laughs> the arrogance, right? And I think Walmart, in particular, took that to heart. You know, Walmart, um, and I, I give a lot of credit to the gentleman who was running Walmart's operations here in China. Or in China, he was all about, look, we're here to to listen and learn, and yes, we want to succeed, but we would like to think that the way that we do business is going to lift all retail. And uh, in his own way, he basically said that um, we're going to help those mom and pops as well as the state-run stores and because we mm-hmm. think everybody is, is going to improve. You know, we did the grand opening uh, in, um, in Shenzhen, I think, in 1996. And with Budweiser, um, uh, Anheuser-Busch, they actually had a joint venture with Qingdao, Qingdao Pijo, the, the, Qing, the famous... That's my hometown, Qingdao. 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 <laughs> it's your, it's, I know it's your hometown. So, and so I think, um, I think Anheuser-Busch thought, well, we've got the right partner, so we're going to succeed right away. They had a, a rough go of it, not just, not just in terms of communicating about their brand, which in, in Chinese, I thought they had a good, a good name, uh, Bai Hui Pijo, which means mm-hmm. 100 times magnificent uh, beer. But because of distribution issues, again, this is the mid-90s, before a lot of the highways were constructed across China, um, the rail service wasn't as, um, wasn't as reliable, and so they had trouble even getting from Wuhan, ironically, which is where they brewed that beer, um, they had a tough time getting it distributed. They had their challenges, but they made a go of it. So flash forward to today, I think both companies, uh, as far as I know, I know Walmart has you know, many, many locations in China and they have major competition uh, again not only other foreign retailers but also you know Chinese retailers as well and Anheuser-Busch Budweiser again still competing with all those small local beer brands in China as well as other foreign brands but I think they're they're doing very very well they both did well and again I think they both in addition to sort of being somewhat humble in introducing their brands they they were both very good about Lori listening to the, the new the new market they were in, uh, and they they quickly understood that it it was not the same. the The sentiment of the of the customers who were drinking beer or shopping at, at a retail store were very different than than their experience here in the states or elsewhere for that matter. And I think they both took their their both formal and informal market research very seriously, and and you know made adjustments along the way. And they had again they had some some challenges and stumbles, but they. They've done very well, I think, overall. I think not just the the way how consumers are shopping in China, it's just thinking about some fundamental things, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the U.S., uh, Walmart usually are outside of the 
center of the city mm -hmm. people because people have cars drive there uh that's and that's those are the places it's cheaper walmart can find a big space and having large parking lots but in china in the mid 90s it's different that's exactly uh, what yeah we, we didn't have car. <laughs> not every family have car. Even now, not every family have cars. Very few, very few family car, have cars. Right, yeah. right. So Walmart, just thinking about the location, first, that's one thing to consider. It's very different than in the U.S. And then uh, the amount people buy. In China, think about in the U.S., we buy a lot yes. each trip, and we don't make so many trips. But in China, you know, some people go shopping every day. <laughs> That's part of the entertainment. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes, it was. And I'll tell you on that note, what was interesting, the, 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 what Walmart wanted to do uh, was to make shopping a good experience. And this, again, is the mid-90s, so you're right. I mean, it was downtown Shenzhen. They knew that most people were going to either come by bicycle or, or literally on foot and carry, have to carry home whatever they bought. Um, but more to the point, you know, frankly speaking, some of the the state-run retailers and the mom and pops, let's say they didn't do a lot to make the shopping experience nice. It was, you know, the stores were maybe not lighted very well. They were not real clean. And particularly in the state-run stores, the people there were, were working for the government, right? So they weren't, the clerks and the, the, the salespeople weren't too friendly to the shoppers. They get salary <laughs> and they are know, working they for salary. the government or <laughs> for the for that shop, right? It's very yeah. different. Yeah, I, I know that. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> right. But so, in, so in Walmart's case, what was interesting at the time here in the United States, they had, Walmart had what they called the 10-foot rule. And that, what that meant was a Walmart associate, which is what they call their staff and employees in a, in a store, was always supposed to be within 10 feet of a customer. So if that customer had a question or a need, the, the associate would be right there. In Shenzhen, Joe Hatfield, the, the, the client that I'm talking about, the man who was running all of Walmart, had what he called the 10-tooth rule. <laughs> what did that mean? It meant I, want, I would like all of our associates to smile and to be open and friendly, right? And uh, there, was no, there was no question they were going to be within 10 feet because their stores were very crowded all the time. But they wanted to give, uh, uh, you know, shoppers an experience. They realized that, you know, shopping, like you said, was at the time. Now everybody's online, of course, in China, like we are here in the U.S. But then it was a form of entertainment. Let's go to the Walmart. Let's go to whatever and, and do the shopping. So, again, Walmart, I think, had in particular had, a, had an ear to the ground and more importantly had an ear toward their customers that uh, they were able to respond to. So. Yeah, I remember when I was traveling to Shenzhen for business and my friend took me to that uh, new store, the Walmart store. That was the first time I got my foot into a Walmart store mm -hmm. uh, in China. And mm -hmm. then very soon, my hometown, Qingdao, also had a Walmart store. And uh, in the very beginning, people have a hard time to remember the name Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just another thing, right? Uh, right? The brand, when you translate into right. Chinese or you, when you go to China market, you want to have a brand that people can understand, yeah, can remember. Uh, I think Budweiser did a great job, as you mentioned earlier. The one, I think perfect brand name uh, that has been the, the American brand that's probably been in China the longest and the perfect translation is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, ah. right? Coca-Cola, yeah. You, you, can, you can tell your listeners what, what that translates to in, in Chinese. Coca-Cola, uh, it means uh, co is mouse, right? You put it in your mouth and you are happy. <laughs> Right. So that also connects to the essence of exactly. what Coca-Cola is. But, right. but, it, but it also sounds almost precisely like Coca-Cola, which is the exactly. brand here. So that, that's sort of a marketer, a marketer, a public relations person's dream is to have that sort of a thing. So, uh, but you're right. I mean, it, very important, the, the translation uh, into Chinese. Our, our company, for example, we called ourselves, because we were a joint venture, uh, Fleischmann Hillard became Fulai. So Fulai Link, uh, Link Public Relations was our sort of joint venture partner. So Fulai means, you know, good fortune will come, right? I mean, that's basically. So we tried to do that. I don't think we succeeded as well as Coca-Cola, but, uh, but you're right. It's very important.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I also want to discuss with you if you uh, think about the U.S. and China, right? With all these stories or the experience, the clients you had. Mm -hmm. um, Think about what are some typical ways we do PR, we do communication, marketing in the U.S., and right. then compare that to China, compare U.S. to China. Uh, what are some things similar in these two countries, and what are some things different? I think that can help our audience get a, uh, more hands-on on what we're talking about. Understood. Well, what, what's interesting is, and I'll, I'll go back in time, you know, the way that, that I was practicing public relations in China on behalf of our clients at the time was even by US standards at that time, pretty what I would call rudimentary it means, you know, we were doing a lot of, uh, you might say ribbon cuttings, grand openings, mm. like Walmart, um, maybe the big band. press conferences, that sort of thing. And we were mostly, we were mostly trying to communicate to, Chinese customers, investors, and the government kind of through the, the news media, which of course in China is largely, is largely, you know, sort of restricted and controlled by the, by the, the, the government. So, you know, a lot of what we, what we did in, in, a, in doing that was to show specifically how a Budweiser or how a Walmart or any of our other clients, how they were going to, you know, help the Chinese people and help, you know, uh, the Chinese economy, not just in terms of like here in the United States, we just talk about the number of jobs that a new, a new business or Amazon is going to bring to Washington, D.C. now or Arlington, Virginia, when they open up their HQ2. But, you know, more specifically, how, um, you know, how the, how the organization is going to help uh, China writ large. Another example, for example, is Monsanto. Meng Shandu was the... Uh, was yeah, the, Meng Shandu. And they're, you know, they're, they were all about helping Chinese agriculture, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So, so again, when we were in, you know, this is 25, 25 years ago, things were very, very different. Now, you, you ask the question, you know, public relations and, and communications is practiced, frankly, similar to the way it is now in the United States. Uh, and the big difference there is, well, clearly, the, you know, the internet, but also social media, and uh, what that has done has enabled uh, any organization, whether it's a government organization or a business or a retailer or anything else, to communicate much more directly with what I call the stakeholders. It could be their customers, it could be their investors, it could be government officials. Um, and so there's very, very sophisticated programs, public relations going on in China now that I, I would put up against any program here that I would I would help a client with here in the United States, or that Fleischman Hillard is helping with clients here in the United States. So there's an emphasis on digital communications. There's much more of an emphasis on measurement and impact, and you can do all that now with uh, with online communications. You can tell how many people have read your yeah. your your promotion. How many people did you convince to come to your virtual event or your lot your real event? Uh, that sort of thing. So. In terms of my profession, the two countries have really sort of merged, I think. Um, and along with that, quite frankly, in China, there is um, obviously less of a reliance on kind of the official channels, like through the, uh, the, the news media we just talked about, uh, although they're, they're still important. I think the news media in China are maybe a little bit freer to cover things and not cover things than perhaps they were in, when I was there uh, in the, the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, definitely. <laughs> it's very different uh, on this side, um, but yeah, still, the still uh, the, the traditional media is correct. controlled by the government. Yeah. And, and, you know, clearly competition is okay in the eyes of both the central authorities and the provincial and local authorities, competition between organizations. And so, um, you know, I think the, the downside, you know, from, from probably American companies now trying to get in there is that, you know, most of my clients, for the most part, had kind of the red carpet rolled out for them, meaning the government, you know, whether it was local, provincial, or central, was by and large happy to have the investment and the American brands come in mm -hmm. there. Um, now, um, you know, there's less of, there's less of the, uh, the red carpet and more of, well, okay, you know, you're, you're certainly allowed to operate here, but don't expect the government to sort of help 
help you with uh, competing against our own companies as well as your other foreign competition. So, so the, the PR program should be more sophisticated because the competition, I think, is, is a little bit more sophisticated as well, I should say, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, let's touch more on that point uh, sure. after the break. Uh, okay. I think uh, there's a lot of things we want to really go deeper into it. Sure. Are you interested in expanding your business to China, but don't know how to start? Are you wondering how to grow your sales in the China market and win over competition? Meet Michelle Zhou and her team at Pacific Technologies Consulting Group. Our consultants are U.S.-China experts and have all lived and worked in both the U.S. and China with many years' experience in market entry strategies, management, and execution. We can help you find the right partners, develop opportunities, and grow your business in China. Please visit ptcgconsulting.com today. Okay, we are back. And before we took the break, we talked, uh, touched on the similarities and the differences between U.S. and China in terms of PR and communications. Uh, I want to go a little bit deeper on that. Sure. Um, I think, Steve, it, it's not everything, you know, goes very well smoothly in China. If you're working in the PR side, uh, you... <laughs> constantly living in a hotspot, right? It's uh, uh, in Chinese way we say it is like a, a hot pan, uh, burning pan with all these ants <laughs> running around. <laughs> all kinds of things may happen, and especially if your products or you know the brands you are representing is related to consumer market, something may happen. So share with us some stories about in China if some crisis, PR crisis happen. Oh. How do you handle that? Or how did you handle that? And sure. what did you learn from that? If you had help to compare that and draw us back to, for example, US or Western world, how PR professionals or the companies handle that and you know, what's the sure. fundamental thinking or the, uh, the thoughts, the mental models behind mm -hmm. those different uh, behaviors. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and there were, you know, as, as you said, Michelle, there were a number of, uh, shall we say, interesting, interesting episodes, you might we'll call them crises, that occurred to, you know, for a number of, a number of clients that we had over there. But we'll start with, again, the two that we've talked about uh, here, which is uh, Walmart and Anheuser-Busch. So in Walmart's case, I was awakened by a phone call from Mr. Hatfield, my client, calling me from Shenzhen. Uh, it was probably Beijing time, obviously Shenzhen time, it was, it was well after midnight. And uh, the reason for that phone call was that he had just heard from Walmart headquarters back here in the United States that the, um, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, we call PETA, which is an NGO here in the United States, which um, at the end of the day, they don't like consumption of any, of any animal protein, um, but they were protesting outside of Walmart stores here in the U.S. the fact that the Walmart Supercenter in Shenzhen, which we had just probably six months earlier done the grand opening, that the Walmart Supercenter in Shenzhen was selling, you know, farmed dog meat. Um, dog. Uh -huh. dog. Dog meat. Dog. Okay, dog. that's pretty well, common. Again, when I was young, I... Well, and, and, and which, which is not necessarily part of Americans' diet, but certainly in China it is. Just as beef is part of Americans' diet, but it certainly isn't part of those living in India, for example. So, you know, culturally, the fact that there was a there was a, a, a case of, of dog meat and it was farmed properly, etc., that was an expectation that Walmart customers were going to have in Shenzhen. But the order, came, because Walmart here did not want the bad publicity that came along with that, they kind of ordered Mr. Hatfield and Walmart to pull the dog meat out of the, out of the, you know, off the off the store shelves, um, which he did. But then, of course, now we had a public relations problem in Shenzhen rather than in in the United States with with PETA, and that was with customers who said, "What happened to the dog meat?" You know, and so. Um, what, what transpired was, and my, my, my colleagues here in the United States with Fleischman Hillard uh, worked with me very, very well. Um, what we did was we went back to PETA, to the NGO here in the United States. Um, we sent photos and documentation of where 
the, the dogs were raised for the meat in, in China. And we said, look, we understand that philosophically you don't like consumption of any animal protein, but please know that the, the, the meat that's sold in, in Walmart is farmed responsibly and, and that sort of thing. And so ultimately struck a, a negotiated a deal, if you will, with, with PETA that, that they would stop protesting and trying to embarrass Walmart. And we were, you know, then ultimately allowed to, to resell the, uh, you know, the, the, the product in, in Shenzhen. And in the meantime, you know, what I advised and what Walmart did was to be open, open with their customers and open, frankly, with, you know, the government officials. They were, you know, their initial joint venture partner was kind of an arm of the Shenzhen government. And they were afraid that, you know, that Walmart was doing something to make Chinese lose face and that sort of thing. And so, but Walmart was honest about the reasons. It's a cultural difference. And ultimately, you know, we communicated, you know, once the, once the, the, the meat was back on the shelves, we were able to give, you know, you know, percent off coupons to any customers interested in that and that sort of thing. So it worked out okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think you pointed a very important point here, the cultural differences, the tradition differences. Uh, Chinese people, you know, for thousands of years, eat dog meat, and the dog meat in many Chinese eyes is like chicken or pig or anything, right? <laughs> <A> cow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, when you talk about that, I connected to some incidents recently. NBA, the Basketball Association, mm -hmm. right? The communication, there's also, <laughs> there was a PR crisis mm -hmm. uh, a year ago, I think last year. Right. Uh, the people in China looking at how the communication was done by MBA, uh, the, mm -hmm. the message they delivered. And the American side also don't understand why we cannot have the freedom to say whatever the players or the managers say, right? And they are not really representing MBA. Uh, MBA. That right. caused a lot of issues. So yes. many right. times things like that happen. And of course, there's also the political reasons, the, you know, okay. how people view their country, all these things. It's, uh, it's okay. not that uh, just so simple. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But, but you said, you know, what lessons could be learned that could apply not only in China, but here. And, you know, in a, in a crisis situation like that, I mean, um, at the end of the day, the, the best, I think the best lesson is to be as open and proactive with communication as you can be. And that's a lesson, frankly, that I think China could learn, but also the U.S. side can learn a lot as well. Um, so, you know, in, in the case that we just talked about, Walmart acknowledged they were sort of asked by management in the U.S. to take, to take the product off the shelf, and they were open about the reasons that they did that. But they also remedied the situation and then sort of, you know, kind of apologized and, and they got back to normal. Um, you know, sometimes... Politics and everything make make what I just said difficult to do, but um, at the end of the day, I think everybody should should you know the default position ought to be okay. Let's let's be as open as we can about the reason for the situation and what we're going to do to fix it, and then right. and then fi then fix it and then tell everybody you fixed it. Uh, and especially for big brands, I think uh, government relationship in addition to PR, right, and yeah. geopolitics are very important things to consider. Be proactive, really check these things before you go public uh, for your announcement. Well, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and and a lot of the, the you know these incidents that I'm talking about, you know, the news never made it out of China, but but nonetheless, they did become. In, on a small scale kind of international incident. So, I mean, the other, the other Walmart incident that we had to deal with was a very, and I don't remember the lady's name, but a very famous Chinese author who was standing in front of a, a, a huge table with her books and she was doing book signing and there was a long line of people in the, in the Shenzhen Walmart Supercenter waiting to receive her book and get her autograph and go buy the book. And she was taking a break and she looked at the book and she realized it was counterfeit. It was not from her, from her publisher. Oh. She got very angry and stormed off. And this, this did become, at least in Shenzhen, kind of a, an incident. Here was, here was an American company, right, an American retailer uh, that was seen as, you know, representing America. And this was at a time when 
the United States was coming down hard on China big time, right, for intellectual property, the theft of the, you know, DVDs were just starting, you, know, you know, CDs and DVDs were really just being produced. And there was, even in Beijing, right near the U.S. Embassy, I could go out and buy, you know, a counterfeit uh, CD of my favorite rock band, you know, that was, that was, that was not for real. But anyway, so Walmart had to, you know, had to, had to basically say, look, we didn't intend for this to happen. They were, you know, they obviously canceled the order. They apologized. They, they made it right. But it was, that's another uh, example of something where, you know, international politics and everything can kind of come into play. So, mm. And IP protection is still an issue in China. Uh, I w lived in this high-tech world. That's one of the concerns why some foreign companies in the high-tech world hesitate sure. when they are considering China market. They like the market. They want to go there. They want to, right. you know, have those users, consumers uh, make the money, but uh, how can they, their technology be protected? You're right, Michelle, but what, one, one thing that I always tell you know, people that I have conversations with about this is that you know, intellectual property theft is not just a problem of the Chinese, quote unquote, stealing intellectual property from American or foreign companies. It's also from each other. So this lady I'm talking about, the author, this was another Chinese publisher that published her book in a counterfeit way. Mm -hmm. So and the Chinese government doesn't talk about that a lot when they're having the international negotiations about IPR, intellectual property theft. But, but I saw it firsthand that, you know, there was plenty of, of intellectual property issues between Chinese organizations and companies too. So... Yeah, the good news is getting better, <laughs> it is, it is. but it's not it ideal. We still need to no, wait. No. It, it, it is, but now that China has has begun to, particularly in the tech world, has become an innovator itself. Mm -hmm. You know, now they what whether it's we, we we talk right now in the news about TikTok and all that. Whether you're talking about that or anything else, now they want to protect the intellectual property that has been, you know, rightfully you know brought you know brought to the fore by them. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's all a question of you know, developments and you know both economies and that sort of thing. So. The other uh, incident, and this is again another consumer crisis, if you will, was Anheuser Busch with Budweiser, and um, what had happened was uh, that at the time, and I think largely it still is, beer was was sold in the large returnable bottles, kind of mm, the know, glass something. bottles, yeah, one, one liter, one liter bottles or something like that. And, and so, so too was Budweiser. And um, in some of the second and third tier markets, you know, Budweiser started getting reports that people were drinking Budweiser and getting very, very sick. Mm -hmm. And this came at a time when the national government was, was trying to really help protect consumers. Again, not just from foreign companies, but, but even from Chinese, you know, from fake goods being sold and that sort of thing. And so they were encouraging people that if they felt that they were cheated or if they were sold something that was supposed to be high quality and it fell apart right away, that they could sue that company in, in the Chinese courts. And the China, I remember March 15 is officially a day uh, for consumer rights or something, right? The government put there. Yes, yeah. You remember that. Yes. So Anyway, so these incidents started to happen. They were usually in, in bars where people would buy the, you know, the, the, the large Budweiser. And then, you know, even before they left the bar, they would start getting violently ill. Well, the uh, Anheuser-Busch investigated and realized that, again, count, local counterfeiters were getting these bottles, maybe from the back, you know, from the back doors of uh, the bars. They were filling those bottles with what we call rot gut or, you know, uh, you know, not really good product at all. And then they were reselling it, recapping it. They had the technology and reselling it. You know, Budweiser took a real hit uh, in the Chinese press and with the Chinese government initially because, of course, everybody thought they were, they were producing this and trying to sell this low-quality product. And the investigation demonstrated, no, that it was being produced by counterfeiters. So what ended up happening was, uh, at great expense to them, they actually changed the whole packaging and put a, a what we call a hologram on the, on the label at the top of the bottle uh, so that it was clear if, if someone had, had recapped the bottle. 
Um, they worked with uh, their partners at Qingdao and also the, you know, the local authorities to, you know, to find the counterfeiters and, and you know, put them, put them to justice. But, and they, you know, we had to sort of announce these things at a national level because um, even then, this is before social media, word, word would, travel, would travel very quickly. The other thing that happened about the same time was they think a competitor of theirs uh, put a rumor into the market that someone had, a worker had fallen into and <laughs> drowned, I don't mean to laugh, drowned in one of the vats of beer oh. in Wuhan that they were brewing. And so what ended up happening for that was we actually suggested, and, and, and Anheuser Busch said it was a good idea, to um, to uh, institutionalize a brewery tour touring uh, program, not necessarily for the for the general public, but for those VIPs, so that anyone would come, they could see how clean it was, what their standards were like, how they went, how they did the process, and that sort of thing. And of course. We brought the Chinese news media in for one of those one of those tours as well because initially some of those rumors had been reported out. So, again, uh, for both of those incidents, it comes back to you know being forthright, you know, being honest, not speculating, you know, in both cases, not speculating, but basically undertaking an investigation with local authorities and then keeping, in this case, the news media and ultimately their customers informed. I'm guessing now that if, if any of those things had happened now or in the last five, seven, ten years, that Walmart and, and Anheuser-Busch would have also been in touch via social media through their own channels in addition to the, to the traditional news media. And that's how, that's how things have changed. Again, not just for American or foreign companies in China, but for Chinese companies. You know, they're much more in touch and they're much more attuned to customer criticism and, and issues and they need to, you know, and they, they've all, they've all done that very, very well, I think so. Yeah, I, I am also a marketing professional and I was working in Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I was in charge of, you know, some of our products and get them launched in China, grow the business in China. So uh, I would say today it's even harder than many years ago when you were in China managing the PR, right? And managing these public opinions because social media, everybody can send some news there and especially your news or the message is unusual <laughs> that get people's eyes. <laughs> so uh, social media definitely is something Absolutely. not just using the American social media or the Western side of social media in China, you need to use the social media tools that the people use there Absolutely. and the word of mouth in China, because Chinese people are very social. It That's just right. goes so fast <laughs> overnight. It, it, it does. And I, I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any scientific evidence to back up what I'm about to say, but I, I would, I think that probably as a, as a people, the Chinese are probably more online and more in tune with social media than the U.S. I know uh, the last time I was in China, just a, a year and a half or so ago, I know that there was a joke that um, the, the new Chinese economy, with everybody being online, particularly with online payments, mm -hmm. has, put, has put the robbers... Mobile payments. <laughs> right. Mobile payments has put the robbers and the muggers out of business because no one carries cash anymore in China, right? Everybody. And so there's nothing to steal from someone in the, in the street. So, but my point is that, uh, yes, online and especially mobile online has become so important uh, and such a, such a big way to communicate in, in China. And of course you have that many more customers and people and markets uh, to, to cover in, in your public relations in China than you do here or even in Europe and elsewhere. So, mm -hmm. And that connects to another question that I want to hear from you, because uh, we talked about this traditional media and uh, we kind of touched on the new things, uh, social media. So if we look at these uh, new trends mm -hmm. happening in China and again comparing with the or connecting with the Western world, what are some new trends we really need to pay attention to if brands are thinking about the China market? or brands are already there <laughs> if they want to really make sure they're doing well. Right, I understand. Um, well, I mean, I think, I think it kind of goes back to what we're, what we're talking about here. A lot of it has to do with, you know, 
you know, if you're already there, continuing to build a relationship with your customers. Now, in the early days, a lot of American companies, whether it's you work for Microsoft or, or you know, these other companies, at a certain level, they thought, well, because we're American, you know, brands, that the Chinese are going to automatically think that represents high quality and they're going to be interested in, even if we're priced at a more premium level. I don't think that's the case anymore. So mm. I think brands, regardless of where their, their parent company resides, need to compete for the business and the admiration uh, and the repeat business of those Chinese consumers. So it's, all, it's a lot about reinforcing that relationship and building it up, whether that's online, whether that's through promotions, whether it's through special events, that sort of thing. Um, and frankly, you know, responding to new competition that comes into the market, whether it's a, it's a new company or a new product from an old competitor, whatever it is, um, you know, continuing to, you know, to surround people. So you're right. It, it, it is, it, it's, it's a much harder job, I think, to, to do that kind of marketing and uh, to build brands in, in China than it, than it probably once was. And, and a lot of that comes down to the, I think, ever increasing power and influence that the Chinese consumer has, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are so many, so many people now in China that, that we would consider to be part of the middle class here, or the upper middle class here, that have the, the wherewithal and the money to spend on products and services. And, um, and so ultimately the power is in the hands of the individual. Uh, it isn't, you know, uh, it's not a government official putting their arm around figuratively around, you know, a European or an American company saying these guys are okay to do business with. It's the individual has to make that decision. So in, in many ways, the market's kind of democratized, I might say. In that yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. If I am the owner mm -hmm. of an American brand or a European Western or site, uh, the brand. Now, let's put on more practical hats to think about um, what I can do. So what do I need to consider when I want to get my products or services to China? Because that's a big market. I, you know, even though the two countries is in this kind of relationship now, um, if I still consider that. Absolutely. Sure. Well, it, it's funny. I, um, I've said for a long time, whether you are a startup that is, you know, wants to get into China for the first time, or if you're an established company that maybe wants to, to introduce a new brand into China uh, or something in between, I mean, there's kind of three broad pieces of, uh, of three considerations, maybe call them pieces of advice if, that I would say, and that would be learn, find, and communicate. So the number one is, you know, learn about the prospective market, in this case, China, right? Mm -hmm. And learning about it is more than just getting on a plane and going and visiting. Um, yes, it's doing that, but it's um, learning about your prospective customers, your prospective competitors. It's literally perhaps living and breathing in the, in the market that you intend to operate in. Learning is, is also at that level communicating with a lot of people, you know, experts, customers, that sort of thing. The next item on my list is find. So learn and then find, find the right partners to help you in, in, in China. It doesn't just mean business partners if you're, if you're going to do a joint venture, although that is important, but it also means partners to help you with legal matters. So it's maybe finding the right lawyers. And frankly, I would say the right, you know, public relations or marketing consultants as well. Um, people that you uh, have a, have a financial business relationship with and who are working, working in your best interests. Uh, early on, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of small clients or, or would be clients that we had would come over and they would, um, have, you know, maybe some relationship with someone Chinese who would say they had the right guanxi, right? Like guanxi and you know, guanxi Chinese relations. Is, is relationships and, and, you know, they, they would make some introductions and, and again, you know, a Western or American, American executive would sort of say, oh, you know, this guy or this lady has great connections and, and they would base their whole strategy based on just that kind of casual. So it needs to be, I think, so finding is again, finding the right people who know the market, 
who know you and who are working in your best interest. And then finally, it's kind of the theme of what we've been talking about is, is communicate. Uh, communicate with all your key stakeholders here in the United States who are going to be helping you get into China, but especially in China. Uh, and then when it comes to actually introducing your brand, you know, remember that first impressions really count. So how you, how you introduce that brand, uh, but then more importantly, or as importantly, how you support the brand. And that's done, that's not just done by communications people like, like Michelle Joe or, or Steve Drake. It also is how you operate the business day in and day out. So people, you know, they always say, I always say at least, a brand is a promise. So, you know, if you buy my product, or my brand, or my service that's a brand, you're, brought, you're buying a promise that you're going to get something. You're going you're gonna to do business with me, and I like to do business a certain way. I have certain values, that sort of thing. So it's continuing to, to do all those other things, learning and listening uh, and finding the right partners, but also, you know, communicating. And again, that also involves, as we said, listening and, and understanding and frank, frankly, making adjustments along the way. Um, so back to, back to some of those, some of those incidents we talked about with, uh, with Walmart or with uh, Anheuser-Busch, they needed to listen, not just during the times of crisis, but they needed to listen all along that continuum uh, to make adjustments in terms of how they were operating, how they were promoting, uh, what they were selling, what their packaging looked like. I mean, it's all very, very important. So it sounds simplistic, but learn, find, and communicate. I would give that advice to any size company that really wants to, to, uh, to get into and do business in the China market. Wow. Learn, find, and communicate. Learn, find, and communicate. That's, those are, that's, my, that's my mantra, but I'm sure others have, have other ideas as well. So. You made it simple, easy to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a simple person, Michelle. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Steve. Okay. Today, we've talked about the key to brand reputation and success in China. You can find out more about Steve Drake at his company website, sdrakeassociates.com. You are listening to In China with Michelle Zhou, and I look forward to talking to our audience next time. Thank you for tuning in to In China with Michelle Zhou. Please join us for another edition next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and 4 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. We'll talk again next week.